Book Four, Sections Twenty Seven through Twenty Nine of King Cole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. King Cole by Upton Sinclair. Book Four: The Will of King Cole. Section Twenty Seven. Edward would have endeavoured to carry his brother away forthwith, but there was no train until late at night. So Hal went upstairs, where he found Moylan and Hartman, with Mary Burke and Mrs. Zamboni, all eager to hear his story. As the members of the committee, who had been out to supper, came straggling in, the story was told again and yet again. They were almost as much delighted as the men in Reminitsky's. If only all strikes that had to be called off could be called off as neatly as that. Between these outbursts of satisfaction they discussed their future. Moylan was going back to Western City, Hartman to his office in Sheridan, from which he would arrange to send new organizers into North Valley. No doubt Cartwright would turn off many men, those who had made themselves conspicuous during the strike, those who continued to talk union out loud. But such men would have to be replaced and the Union knew through what agencies the company got its hands. The North Valley miners would find themselves mysteriously provided with Union literature in their various languages. It would be slipped under their pillows, or into their dinner pails, or the pockets of their coats while they were at work. Also there was propaganda to be carried on among those who were turned away so that, wherever they went, they would take the message of unionism. There had been a sympathetic outburst in Barela, Hal learned, starting quite spontaneously that morning, when the men heard what had happened at North Valley. A score of workers had been fired, and more would probably follow in the morning. Here was a job for the members of the kidnapped committee. Tim Rafferty, for example, would he care to stay in Pedro for a week or two, to meet such men, and give them literature and arguments? This offer was welcome, for life looked desolate to the Irish boy at this moment. He was out of a job, his father was a wreck, his family destitute and helpless. They would have to leave their home, of course. There would be no place for any Rafferty in North Valley. Where they would go, God only knew. Tim would become a wanderer, living away from his people, starving himself and sending home his pitiful savings. Hal was watching the boy and reading these thoughts. He, Hal Warner, would play the god out of a machine in this case, and in several others equally pitiful. He had the right to sign his father's name to checks, a privilege which he believed he could retain, even while undertaking the role of Harun al-Rashid in a mine disaster. But what about the mine disasters and abortive strikes where there did not happen to be any Harun al-Rashid at hand? What about those people right in North Valley who did not happen to have told Hal of their affairs? He perceived that it was only by turning his back and running that he would escape from his adventure with any portion of his self-possession. Truly, this fair-seeming and wonderful civilization was like the floor of a charnel-house or a field of battle. Anywhere one drove a spade beneath its surface, he uncovered horrors, sights for the eyes and stenches for the nostrils that caused him to turn sick. There was Rusick, for example. He had a wife and two children, and not a dollar in the world. In the year and more that he had worked, faithfully and persistently, to get out coal for Peter Harrigan, he had never once been able to get ahead of his bill for the necessities of life at old Peter's store. All his belongings in the world could be carried in a bundle on his back and whether he ever saw these again would depend upon the whim of old Peter's camp-marshal and guards. Rusick would take to the road, with a ticket purchased by the Union. Perhaps he would find a job, and perhaps not. 
In any case, the best he could hope for in life was to work for some other Harrigan, and run into debt at some other company store. There was Hobianish, a Serbian, and Hernandez, a Mexican, of whom the same things were true, except that one had four children and the other six. Bill Warhope had only a wife. Their babies had died, thank heaven, he said. He did not seem to have been much moved by Jim Moylan's pleadings. He was down and out. He would take to the road and beat his way to the east and back to England. They called this a free country. By God, if he were to tell what had happened to him, he could not get an English miner to believe it. Hal gave these men his real name and address, and made them promise to let him know how they got along. He would help a little, he said. In his mind he was figuring how much he ought to do. How far shall a man go in relieving the starvation about him, before he can enjoy his meals in a well-appointed club? What casuist will work out this problem, telling him the percentage he shall relieve of the starvation he happens personally to know about, the percentage of that which he sees on the streets, the percentage of that about which he reads in government reports on the rise in the cost of living. To what extent is he permitted to close his eyes as he walks along the streets on his way to the club? To what extent is he permitted to avoid reading government reports before going out to dinner dances with his fiancée? Problems such as these the masters of the higher mathematics have neglected to solve. The wise men of the academies and the holy men of the churches have likewise failed to work out the formulas, and Howe, trying to obtain them by his crude mental arithmetic, found no satisfaction in the results. End of section 27 Section 28 Hal wanted a chance to talk to Mary Burke. They had had no intimate talk since the meeting with Jesse Arthur, and now he was going away, for a long time. He wanted to find out what plans Mary had for the future, and, more important yet, what was her state of mind. If he had been able to lift this girl from despair, his summer course in practical sociology had not been all a failure. He asked her to go with him to say good-bye to John Edstrom, whom he had not seen since their unceremonious parting at McKellar's, when Hal had fled to Percy Harrigan's train. Downstairs in the lobby Hal explained his errand to his waiting brother, who made no comment, but merely remarked that he would follow if Hal had no objection. He did not care to make the acquaintance of the Hibernian Joan of Arc, and would not come close enough to interfere with Hal's conversation with the lady. But he wished to do what he could for his brother's protection. So there set out a moonlight procession, first Hal and Mary, then Edward, and then Edward's dinner-table companion, the hardware drummer. Hal was embarrassed in beginning his farewell talk with Mary. He had no idea how she felt towards him, and he admitted with a guilty pang that he was a little afraid to find out. He thought it best to be cheerful, so he started to tell her how fine he thought her conduct during the strike. But she did not respond to his remarks, and at last he realized that she was laboring with some thoughts of her own. "'There's something I got to say to ye,' she began suddenly. A couple of days ago I knew how I meant to say it, but now I don't. Well, he laughed, say it as you meant to. No, twas bitter, and now I'm on my knees before ye. Not that I want you to be bitter, said Hal, still laughing, but it's I that ought to be on my knees before you. I didn't accomplish anything, you know. Ye did all ye could and more than the rest of us. I want ye to know I'll never forget it, but I want ye to hear the other thing, too." 
She walked on, staring before her, doubling up her hands in agitation. "'Well,' said he, still trying to keep a cheerful tone. "'You remember that day just after the explosion? You remember what I said about—about about going away with ye? I take it back.' "'Oh, of course,' said he, quickly. "'You were distracted, Mary. You didn't know what you were saying.' "'No, no, that's not it. But I've changed my mind. I don't mean to throw meself away.' "'I told you you'd see it that way,' he said. "'No man is worth it.' "'Ah, lad,' said she, "'tis the fine soothing tongue ye have. But I'd rather ye knew the truth. Tis that I've seen the other girl, and I hate her.' They walked for a bit in silence. Hal had sense enough to realize that here was a difficult subject. "'I don't want to be a prig, Mary,' he said gently. "'But you'll change your mind about that, too. You'll not hate her. You'll be sorry for her.' She laughed, a raw, harsh laugh. "'What kind of a joke is that?' "'I know. It may seem like one.' but it'll come to you some day. You have a wonderful thing to live and fight for, while she—" He hesitated a moment, for he was not sure of his own ideas on this subject. She has so many things to learn, and she may never learn them. She'll miss some fine things. "'I know one of the fine things she does not mean to miss,' said Mary grimly. That's Mr. Hal Warner. Then, after they had walked again in silence, I want ye to understand me, Mr. Warner. Ah, Mary, he pleaded, don't treat me that way. I'm Joe. All right, she said. Joe ye shall be. Twill remind ye of a pretty adventure, being a workin' man for a few weeks. Well, that's a part of what I have to tell ye. I've got my pride even if I'm only a poor miner's daughter. And the other day I found out me place." "'How do you mean?' he asked. "'Ye don't understand? Honest?' "'No, honest,' he said. "'Ye're stupid with women, Joe. Ye didn't see what the girl did to me. Twas some kind of a bug I was to her. She was not sure if I was the kind that bites, but she took no chances. She threw me off, like that, and Mary snapped her hand, as one does when troubled with a bug. "'Ah, now,' pleaded Hal, "'you're not being fair.' "'I'm being just as fair as I've got it in me to be, Joe. I been off and had it all out. I can see this much. Tis not her fault, maybe. Tis her class. Tis all of ye the very best of ye, even yeself, Joe Smith." "'Yea,' he replied, "'Tim Rafferty said that.' "'Tim said too much, but a part of it was true. Ye think ye've come here and been one of us workin' people. But don't your own sense tell you the difference? As if it was a canyon a million miles across, between a poor ignorant creature in a minin' camp and a rich man's daughter, a lady? Ye'd tell me not to be ashamed of poverty, but would ye ever put me by the side of her, for all your fine feelings of friendship for them that's beneath ye? Didn't ye show that at the Minettis? But don't you see, Mary? He made an effort to laugh. I got used to obeying Jessie. I knew her a long time before I knew you. Ah, Joe, ye've a kind heart and a pleasant way of speaking. But wouldn't it interest ye to know the real truth? Ye said ye'd come out here to learn the truth." And Hal answered in a low voice, Yes, and did not interrupt again. End of section 28 Section 29 Mary's voice had dropped low and Hal thought how rich and warm it was when she was deeply moved. She went on. I lived all me life in minin' camps, Joe Smith, 
and I seen men robbed and beaten, and women crying, and childer hungry. I seen the company, like some great wicked beast that eat them up. But I never knew why, or what it meant, till that day there at the Minetti's. I'd read about fine ladies in books, you see. But I'd never been spoke to by one. I'd never had to swallow one, as ye might say. But there I did, and all at once I seemed to know where the money goes that's wrung out of the miners. I saw why people were robbin' us, grindin' the life out of us, for fine ladies like that, to keep them so shinin' and soft. T'would not have been so bad if she'd not come just then, with all the men and boys dyin' down in the pits, dyin' for that soft white skin and those soft white hands, and all those silky things she swished round in. My God, Joe, do you know what she seemed to me like? Like a smooth, sleek cat that has just eat up a whole nest full of baby mice, and has the blood of them all over her cheeks. Mary paused, breathing hard. Hal kept silence, and she went on again. I had it out with meself, Joe. I don't want ye to think I'm any better than I am, and I asked meself this question. Is it for the men in the pits that ye hate her with such black murder? Or is it for the one man ye want and that she's got? And I knew the answer to that. But then I asked meself another question, too. Would ye be like her if ye could? Would ye do what she's doin' right now? Would ye have it on your soul? And as God hears me, Joe, tis the truth I speak, I'd not do it. No, not for the love of any man that ever walked on this earth. She had lifted her clenched fist as she spoke. She let it fall again and strode on, not even glancing at him. Ye might try a thousand years, Joe, and ye'd not realize the feelings that come to me there at the Minetti's. The shame of it. Not what she done to me, but what she made me in me own eyes. Me, the daughter of a drunken old miner, and her, I don't know what her father is, but she's some sort of princess, and she knows it. And that's the thing that counts, Joe. "'Tis not that she has so much money, and so many fine things, that she knows how to talk and I don't, and that her voice is sweet, and mine is ugly when I'm raging as I am now. No, tis that she's so sure. That's the word I found to say it. She's sure, sure, sure. She has the fine things. She's always had them. She has a right to have them. And I have a right to nothing but trouble. I'm hunted all day by misery and fear. I've lost even the roof over me head. Joe, ye know I've got some temper. I'm not easy to beat down. But when I'd got through being taught me place, I went off and hid meself. I ground me face in the dirt for the black rage of it. I said to meself, "'Tis true. There's something in her better than me." She's some kind of finer creature. Look at these hands. She held them out in the moonlight with a swift, passionate gesture. So she's a right to her man, and I'm a fool to have ever raised me eyes to him. I have to see him go away and crawl back into me leaky old shack. Yes, that's the truth. And when I point it out to the man, what do you think he says? Why, he tells me gently and kindly that I ought to be sorry for her. Christ, did ye ever hear the like of that? There was a long silence. Hal could not have said anything now if he had wished to. He knew that this was what he had come to seek. This was the naked soul of the class war. Now concluded Mary, with clenched hands and a voice that corresponded. Now I've had it out. I'm no slave. I've just as good a right to life as any lady. I know I'll never have it, of course. I'll never wear good clothes, nor live in a decent home, 
nor have the man I want. But I'll know that I've done something to help free the workin' people from the shame that's put on them. That's what the strike done for me, Joe. The strike showed me the way. We're beat this time, but somehow it hasn't made the difference ye might think. I'm going to make more strikes before I quit, and they won't all of them be beat. She stopped speaking, and Hal walked beside her, stirred by a conflict of emotions. His vision of her was indeed true. She would make more strikes. He was glad and proud of that. But then came the thought that while she, a girl, was going on with the bitter war, he, a man, would be eating grilled beefsteaks at the club. Mary, he said, I'm ashamed of myself. That's not it, Joe. Ye've no call to be ashamed. Ye can't help it where ye were born. Perhaps not, Mary, but when a man knows he's never paid for any of the things he's enjoyed all his life, surely the least he can do is to be ashamed. I hope you'll try not to hate me as you do the others. I never hated ye, Joe, not for one moment. I tell ye fair and true, I love ye as much as ever. I can say it, because I'd not have ye now. I've seen the other girl, and I know ye'd never be satisfied with me. I don't know if I ought to say it, but I'm thinking ye'll not be altogether satisfied with her, either. Ye'll be unhappy either way. God help ye. The girl had read deeply into his soul in this last speech, so deeply that Hal could not trust himself to answer. They were passing a street lamp, and she looked at him, for the first time since they had started on their walk, and saw harassment in his face. A sudden tenderness came into her voice. Joe, she said, you're lookin' bad. Tis good you're goin' away from this place. He tried to smile, but the effort was feeble. Joe, she went on, ye asked me to be your friend. Well, I'll be that. And she held out the big, rough hand. He took it. We'll not forget each other, Mary, he said. There was a catch in his voice. Sure, lad she exclaimed. We'll make another strike some day, just like we did at North Valley. Hal pressed the big hand, but then suddenly, remembering his brother stalking solemnly in the rear, he relinquished the clasp, and failed to say all the fine things he had in his mind. He called himself a rebel, but not enough to be sentimental before Edward. End of section 29